Today's conversation will delve into the critical tools and expertise necessary for Ukraine's cyber resilience. TMF is honored to be hosting this important conversation, and our work on AI and cybersecurity is extensive. Just last week, we published the AI Election Security Handbook, and in our groundbreaking Foreign Policy and Technology Report, we have detailed many of the themes we're going to hit on today. In no time in history is the intersection among policy, politics, business, and technology been more front and center to the issues of our time as they are now. Under GMS visionary leader, Heather Conley, who's in Munich right now, and sends her best regards, we are launching significant efforts on how Europe and the U.S. can cooperate to enhance their allied competitiveness. I spent a month in Europe. GMF just hosted this amazing series that was really interesting about competitiveness across all sectors. We really have people in every country who came out from business and technology and the public sector and all. And it was a remarkably an aligned conversation. And shortly, we're going to be hosting European members of parliament to discuss digital issues with their American counterparts. Stay tuned. Our new and unique AI conversation series, headed by Karen, who is with us today, has the top leaders in the AI field, literally from Europe and the United States, from Silicon Valley to Washington to the governments of the world. They're talking very bluntly and candidly about how we should be thinking about the most dramatic change in technology probably in the history of the world. We are well in motion for you for the 21st century. Today, we're thrilled to be hosting the US first ambassador at large and my dear friend, Nate Fick. He's ambassador at large for cybersecurity and digital policy. Prior to joining the State Department, Ambassador Fick was a technology CEO and entrepreneur and a distinguished leader in the Marines. I still actually give away his book, uh, One Bullet Away, every opportunity I can. Because <laughs> it's, it's for me, it's actually it's a piece of literature as well as Thank you, Chris. a moving, moving book. Jen Easterly needs no introduction. She's the director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. She was nominated by President Biden in April of 2021 and unanimously confirmed by the Senate, which is, seems unfathomable, but in fact, it didn't happen. <laughs> uh, her record in service is also astounding, having won two bronze stars in the service of her country. And moderating this also needs no uh, introduction at all. We have Margaret Brennan, known to us all here from Face the Nation and CBS. She's also Network's Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent here in Washington, D.C. And so with that, Margaret, I hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming out today and for all of you uh, streaming and watching online. And another endorsement for your book. I think my <laughs> husband said right before he went to officer candidate school, it was that book that he read to prep him um, to go be a Marine. So Modern, thank you. Um, you both have a military background. You were Army as well. Um, so thank you for all the continued service to the country on both fronts. Uh, Director Easterly, I want to... I want to start with you and this trip to Kyiv, Ukraine you just took. You know, I think of your agency as very much domestically focused. So explain to me what the role is and what you were working on there. Yeah. So thanks for asking. Just to give a little sense of context here, you know, we were one day on the ground in Kyiv, but it was an incredible experience, very impactful. And in particular, I think it was very meaningful to be there with Nate. You know, a friend, a colleague, a fellow combat veteran, but in particular to show our Ukrainian partners and our international partners America's top cyber diplomat and the head of the America's Cyber Defense Agency. I think that was a really, really important signal in terms of unity in our approach to the defense of global cyberspace, mm -hmm. as well as the defense of critical infrastructure from the full range of threats. And so from the morning where our train was held because of a bombing happening in Kyiv to a visit to a statue of Princess Ola, uh, which had this uh, bulletproof vest that was put on it by the women's veteran movement uh, in a signal towards the need for better equipment for the 40,000 women who are Ukrainian army soldiers to the venue for the International Resilience Forum, which was pulsating with energy like, frankly, a U2 concert. <laughs> the entire experience was about resilience and innovation and bravery. But I think most importantly, and, and Nate should weigh in, most importantly, it was uh, just a reinforcement of the absolute imperative mm -hmm. that we have to continue to support Ukraine, both from a cyber perspective but from a national perspective, because the defense of Ukraine is really national security for America and homeland security. And on that 
point of infrastructure. Russia has made civilian infrastructure a target of their attacks, or arguably a war crime. Um, you have experience about protecting critical infrastructure. Is that where you were weighing in the most? Yeah, I mean, across the board, we had a series of meetings. We were really there, I think, the first um, uh, senior trip of cyber uh, professionals. And so we met with a full range of Ukrainian officials. Our partner there is what's called the SSS CIP, who we've been working with for years, but formally signed a memorandum of cooperation in the summer of 2022, which provides a full range of support and training, exercise, intelligence exchange, equipment, uh, all sort of uh, tools and capabilities that we work with. And we exchange uh, intelligence with them every single day. So it is about cybersecurity. It is about the defense of critical infrastructure. But as you said, I think it's notable that Russia has been barraging Ukraine, both, both from a cyber perspective, but also from a kinetic perspective. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen and what we've learned from Ukraine is this incredible ability to withstand the disruption, to be able to recover rapidly, and then to continue to provide services to the Ukrainian people. I mean, that, that's what I was talking about in terms of the power of resilience. And it's not just cyber resilience or operational resilience, it's human resilience, which is something that I think America needs to learn from our Ukrainian partners. And Ambassador, what was the significance of the two of you going together, and what did you learn? I think the overarching significance, uh, Margaret, was to convey a sense of what we're calling digital solidarity. There, there's been a movement afoot in the world uh, in the last several years around digital sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's seduction, uh, but it's a mirage. The idea that any country or any company can be strong enough to go it alone in these cross-cutting technologies that are intrinsically transnational. Mm -hmm. And so I think, the, as, as Director Easterly said, uh, having the, the nation's kind of head goalie uh, and, and head diplomat on these issues shoulder to shoulder, literally and figuratively, uh, sends some very clear signals. It sends a signal that uh, our foreign policy on these topics is only ever as strong as our domestic policy. Mm -hmm. That's one. Uh, another is that we have allies and partners all around the world who are looking to the United States for uh, best practices, for examples, for uh, capacity building. And the State Department has a ton of diplomatic and policy expertise, but we rely on partners for the deep operational and technical expertise, and there's no better partner in the world on these topics than CISA. So together, we could bring a set of resources uh, to our Ukrainian counterparts that neither of us could bring to the table alone. Are you anticipating that this will be even more of a target for Russia going into the year, the targeting of civilian infrastructure and use of cyber? Because they've largely, at least the perception, is remain fairly restrained on the cyber front. So I, I think there may be, uh, it's, worth, it's worth disentangling some, some different threads there. Uh, Russia has been generally restrained on the cyber front outside Ukraine. Uh, there are probably many reasons for that, uh, NATO being prominent among them. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Article 5 uh, and the strength of collective deterrence is, is a significant part of it. We did, of course, see the attack on Viasat early on. Uh, and maybe just a side comment on that. We invested the time, I think, across the US government uh, to do the forensics in order to do an empirical attribution of that attack. And then we invested the diplomatic energy in building a multilateral coalition in order to do a collective public attribution. That took time, mm -hmm. um, but it was worth it because, uh, again, digital solidarity, the idea we hang together on these things or we surely will hang separately. And uh, so inside Ukraine is a different matter. There, uh, my perspective, and, and we should hear what Jen has to say, my perspective is the Russians have actually been quite active uh, in cyber terms, but Ukrainian defenses have been pretty good. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, we, when we first learned of the potential invasion, 
we were obviously very concerned about potential retaliatory attacks yes. on U.S. critical infrastructure. And we have not seen that for a variety of reasons, but we have certainly seen relentless attacks, both kinetic, and that's why I think the cyber piece gets overshadowed, because the kinetic piece is so barbaric mm -hmm. um, and so destructive. But I think they continue to suffer cyber attacks. But also, they've become incredibly good at cyber defense. Uh, and that's one reason why we're very proud to partner with them. I, I think it's important to understand the, the larger context, though, because the other thing that uh, the ambassador and I were there to do was to show that we, we believe it is imperative that the United States of America continues to show unwavering support to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So here we are in the German Marshall uh, Fund Foundation. And I think this is a perfect place for us to be because you think about the Marshall Fund, uh, uh, the European Recovery Fund, and what Marshall said about it was, well, Americans don't really understand the plight of those in the troubled areas overseas, but really how important is it that we support their recovery for our own security, for our own economy, for global stability, for lasting peace? That could not be more true today than with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So the defense of Ukraine is not just about being a good partner and being a leader and solidarity. It's really about US national security and homeland security. And so that's the other incredible thing that I think our presence was able to convey in just a day. Do you think you need to convey that to Capitol Hill right now, where the Ukraine supplemental has been uh, held up? Uh, dead on arrival was the phrase used by the Speaker of the House when it comes to the package that the Senate passed. Yeah, I think as you saw, the President was very forceful uh, in calling for the passage of uh, the Senate uh, bill. I was encouraged to see uh, Chairman Mike Turner, the head of the Intel Committee, who was in Kiev a couple days after mm -hmm. us with a bipartisan delegation. I do think um, people who pay attention to history understand the stakes here. Because even at the end of the day, just take cyber, our area of expertise. We know about the relentless attacks on Ukraine by Russia. But at the same time, what we now know is that China, which of course has committed to a no limits partnership with Russia, has been burrowing into our own critical infrastructure in order to prepare for destructive attack in the event of a major conflict. So that's a world where uh, you would see exploding pipelines, water polluted, severing of telecommunications, crippling of transportation to incite chaos and panic in the event of action in the Taiwan Strait. So the point is for every lawmaker, for everybody in national security, you can't look at Ukraine as an isolated case. Ukraine, what we see in Ukraine could be a precursor to what happens in the Taiwan Straits, what happens here at home. So the defense of Ukraine is not just a vote against Putin or a vote against the Russian Sino Alliance or the, the, the rise of autocracies around the world. The failure to defend Ukraine is ultimately a failure to deter China. Mm -hmm. If I could add to yes. that. Uh, Let's also think about it in clear-eyed investment terms. So for an aggregate cost of something like 10% of one year's defense budget uh, in the United States, the Ukrainian military, not the US military, the Ukrainian military has at this point taken out of action something like 90% of Russia's forces that existed on the day of the further invasion and something like two thirds of their tanks, just to use two uh, Specific measures. to their army. Specific to their army. Right. And so uh, in, in pure investment terms, uh, it's hard to imagine any president, any administration, any member of Congress since the end of World War II uh, who would have made the case that this is not a pretty spectacular ROI. To Jen's point of the increasing interconnectedness of all these things, uh, we certainly see it across the board on the digital front, an increasing alignment and cooperation uh, from the level of uh, values and principles and norms all the way down through uh, operational and technical collaboration among uh, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. So it, it's a luxury, luxury we can't afford to think that we can fully disaggregate these mm -hmm. things and, and take them in, in fully separate terms. Are you seeing more co coordination among those bad actors on the cyber front? Indeed, definitely, across multiple vectors. How so? 
uh, I mean, there, there, there are limits, limits to that conversation, uh, but um, uh, think about the no limits partnership, the no limits friendship. Uh, I, I tend to think a good rule of thumb uh, when someone tells you who they are, believe them. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Putin and Xi stand up and announce a no limits partnership, we should take that at face value. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Director Easterly, are you saying basically in, in some of your remarks about China and Taiwan that we should look at Ukraine as a place to learn the lessons of how to defend U.S. infrastructure and U the United States against Absolutely. an aggressor? I mean, is uh -huh. that how you are sort of Absolutely. I mean, it goes to something that I think is incredibly impressive. Think back about 2014, 2015, 2016, where Russian attacks against Ukraine turned off the power. Mm -hmm. So think about how they've evolved over the past 10 years. One of the things that, one of the um, engagements that the ambassador and I had was with the CEO of Ukrainergo, which actually runs their electricity transmission systems. And to see how they've evolved over the past 10 years in their ability to create resilience into their stations and substations for mm -hmm. electricity transmission was pretty incredible. So this ty these types of lessons about resilience is something that we've been talking about at CISA more and more because in this highly connected, highly interdependent, highly vulnerable world where the technology we rely on every hour of every day is inherently insecure, we have to be resilient. We have to prepare for disruption. We have to be able to respond and recover. And when I talk about resilience, it's not just physical and operational resilience. This, this whole idea of societal resilience, mm -hmm. I mean, think back about the reaction to colonial pipeline. Yeah. Think back about the reaction to the high altitude balloon. And look at what's happening in our country today. I mean, when we're dealing with the most serious adversaries, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, we have to be united as an American people to keep our nation safe. And that's a lesson that we are absolutely learning from Ukraine. Um, Ambassador, uh, NATO, after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, updated its war plans for the first time since late 1980s. Mm -hmm. How confident are you in terms of the Western alliance's ability to deter cyber attacks and uh, the threat to the alliance? Like, uh, is the policy clear at this point? Hmm. So f first, just viscerally, um, when, you, when you ride the train from Poland to Kyiv and you cross the fence into Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, one has a visceral appreciation of, uh, of, of NATO. Um, you come back across the fence in the middle of the night, and, and I think we felt like we were sheltering again under the warm embrace of Article 5. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, it does matter, and it's worth feeling that viscerally. So, uh, yeah, uh, NATO, there's been a concerted effort at NATO in the last couple of years to update uh, its cyber uh, approach mm -hmm. from reinvigorating NATO's cyber defense pledge to launching something called the Virtual Cyber Incident Response Capability uh, in, in order to bring a, a menu of public and private sector response options to the table for member states to draw on in the event of an attack. Uh, many NATO states are collaborating with us to support something called the Tallinn Mechanism, uh, which if, if I had to identify one of the most important things that we can accomplish in this period of time, it is making sure that Tallinn, the Tallinn mechanism, is kind of fully realized and effective. It's That's a, after Tallinn, Estonia? It is named after Tallinn, Estonia. So the Estonians are running the front office in Ukraine. The Poles are running the back office, kind of administrative support. The mechanism, think about it as um, almost like digital Ramstein. So there's the Ramstein process, which is a monthly meeting of NATO defense ministers in order to rack and stack, prioritize, deconflict, and accelerate kinetic support to Ukraine. The Tallinn mechanism is a process to uh, prioritize, coordinate, and accelerate digital assistance to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have 10 donor countries now uh, from across the NATO alliance. And uh, the Ukrainians, you know, in the spirit of nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, the priorities are set by Ukraine in consultation with us. 
Uh, and it's a way to flow really significant cyber and digital assistance to Ukraine across that whole spectrum of activity from cyber defense in the ways that we really understand it uh, to uh, trustworthy cloud infrastructure to telecommunications. So based on what you have observed, what do you expect in the year to come? Because the reality is you are making a compelling case for continuing to support Ukraine, but it isn't at all clear the timeline, at least, for when U.S. support, if it would be approved, could actually happen. Um, are you viewing cyber as increasingly vulnerable in Ukraine? Is this a new area of focus for Russia in a more intense way? I think just broadly, um, I think we just have to take a little bit of a step back and, and say that what Ukraine and its supporters have achieved over the past few years is actually pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, Russia nuclear weapons, three times the population of Ukraine, 10 times the GDP, a military many more times in terms of personnel and equipment. The Russians have been on the offense for many months now. They've lost a total of about 300,000 wounded and killed. And they've gained very little territory. Ukraine has 80% of its territory, roughly where it was two years ago. So I, I think there's a lot of hand-wringing broadly about Ukraine's going to lose. Yes, they need ammunition. They need uh, equipment. But at the end of the day, we should all realize they've done remarkably well with mm -hmm. the support that they've gotten to date. Now, from a cyber perspective, nothing will change what we are doing uh, collaboratively to continue to support them, which is through an interagency inter agreement that is funded by state that will continue to be funded. And so we will continue to provide equipment, training, intelligence, um, support across the board. And we will do that with our other international partners. That's another great new story here, the global collaboration, and hand in hand with industry so that we all understand the threat picture so together we can reduce the risk. But I have no concerns about Ukrainian cyber defenders continuing ability to defend their critical infrastructure. So that funding will continue uninterrupted by what's happening in Congress is what you're saying. Um, Ambassador, you've been calling for, and I guess Congress recently authorized this dedicated fund for cyber um, and technology assistance. How is that going to work? So, uh, the foundational idea here, uh, Margaret, is that technology innovation as a source of national power is increasingly determinative. We see it in Ukraine, uh, a country that is so much smaller in every dimension, uh, as, as uh, Jen described, is more than holding its own mm -hmm. against a large adversary, largely because of the way that they have used technology asymmetrically. So uh, tech innovation as a source of national power is, is uh, more determinative than traditional measures like GDP or military capacity. Those things are downstream of tech innovation. So in that world, uh, we need to make sure that our assistance tools are fit for purpose um, and that we can actually bring uh, compelling capability to bear quickly uh, in, at the speed of our adversaries, at the speed of tech. So thanks to bipartisan and bicameral congressional support, uh, we have now a dedicated cyber digital and critical technology assistance fund. Uh, we need to get it funded. It has to get appropriated. Okay. Uh, now that that is looking very good. There too, we have bipartisan and bicameral support, and we have incredible test cases, including in Ukraine. What's the timeline for that? It's a timeline for anything on Capitol Hill these days. <laughs> uh, the sooner yeah. the better. A lot rides on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. An enormous amount rides on it. Make no mistake, the world is watching. Uh, Thank goodness that our allies and partners in the EU passed their $50 billion mm -hmm. plus assistance package. So uh, let's remember, back to digital solidarity, we're not going it alone here. Uh, we have allies and partners who are stepping up and fighting uh, alongside the Ukrainians, supporting the Ukrainians, and standing with us. Uh, this is a question now of the United States needing to do its share. Mm -hmm. um, in talking about the threat picture with technology, uh, Director Easterly, I, I have to ask you about this within the past 24 hours spike in concern about the weaponization of space mm -hmm. and specifically the threat from Russia, given what uh, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee made public yesterday about this national security concern, which I believe we will be hearing more about today in more detail. Um, 
what can you share with us about how you view this threat specifically when it comes to the United States? Yeah. So certainly I don't want to get ahead of the White House or any briefing that's going on, but I think it just further reinforces the fact that Russia is a very real threat. It's a threat to U.S. national security. It's a threat to global security. It's a threat to all of our critical infrastructure. We know space is a key piece of that. And it just reinforces the point that we cannot do anything that further empowers Putin and his ability to, if Ukraine falls, his ability to then uh, go into Europe. We spent um, uh, the day after Kiev in Poland. There was an interview you might be aware of with the with Putin, uh, mm -hmm. where he mentioned yes. uh, Poland 30 times. Yes. Uh, Poland actually pays more based on their GDP than any country. And they are very concerned that if Ukraine were to fall to Russia, you could see Poland, you could see Slovakia, you could see Romania. So, And by the way, that would then likely mean it would cost much, much more in our budget if we had to put troops back in like mm -hmm. we did. Uh, before, if we had to pay more for our defense budget. So we need to take this threat seriously and not look at Ukraine as an isolated case where we can just leave that to, to Russia's uh, attack. Are you saying there then that this um, specific new technology and Russia's use of it should be viewed as a, um, as a direct aggressive move against the United States in particular? I don't really know because okay. uh, I don't have the details. Uh, I think the big strategic question is um, the need to take Russia very, very seriously as a threat to our fundamental national security. Mm -hmm. Ambassador, did you want to weigh in on this? I, I concur. Uh, I think, again, uh, back to broad alignment and collaboration and cooperation among our adversaries and among our competitors on these topics. Uh, we can't treat them in isolation, and we have to deal with them, uh, confront them, uh, I think in a very clear-eyed way uh, and, and see the world as it is, not the world as we wish it were. We, most of us in this room, kind of came of age, you know, educationally and professionally, reading books like The World is Flat and The End of History. Well, the world's not flat. You know, history didn't end. We're seeing a resurgence here of uh, the world the way perhaps it was over a longer period of time. Uh, and, um, you know, I, uh, Thucydides' me, uh, uh, Melian dialogue is, is kind of resonating, right? The famous line, the strong do what they can and the weak do what they must. That's not a world that we should live in and we shouldn't tolerate it. When, in the course of this conversation, I, I think you, Director, talked about um, our increased reliance just society, across the society on technology. And so that makes us more and more inherently vulnerable to this kind of warfare or weaponry that you are talking about. Do you think that there is enough appreciation among the appropriators mm -hmm. um, and among those on Capitol Hill to build up US infrastructure? I think there is a great appreciation for the importance of strong critical infrastructure, obviously with the Infrastructure uh, Act and the money that's been put in into infrastructure across the country, I think we should give the president huge um, you know, cheers on that. But what there's not appreciation for, Margaret, much to my chagrin, is the fact that the technology that underpins that critical infrastructure is inherently insecure, mm -hmm. is full of vulnerabilities, full of flaws, full of defects. Why? Because these software providers and manufacturers were never held responsible for secure tech, and I talked about this at a, at a hearing a couple weeks ago, essentially that's why the Chinese were able to break into our infrastructure um, because of inherently insecure technology that we rely upon, which is why we're calling on technology manufacturers to design and to build and to test and to deliver safe and secure technology so that the American people can actually be safe and secure in how we get our water, our energy, our health care, our education, our transportation, our communication. These, at the end of the day, are the networks and the systems and the data that we rely upon to power our lives. And technology manufacturers, we have to, and the National Cyber Strategy talked about this at length, we have to shift the burden from individuals and small businesses 
to the technology manufacturers who are those who can bear it. And part of what, where Congress can help here are minimum standards for critical infrastructure, including technology manufacturers, and perhaps most importantly, a software liability regime that's rooted in a standard of care that's measurable, and then also safe haven for technology manufacturers who do responsibly innovate by prioritizing security over speed to market or, or cooled features or cost. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about all of this, I'm thinking Microsoft. Is that who you're thinking of? Uh, not specifically. And you know, we've worked hand in hand with Microsoft, uh, certainly since I became the director, um, to make sure that they understand, you know, because where the government is the biggest client, right. um, how important it is to have safe technology, not just for the government, but across critical infrastructure. And we continue to work with them, but it's not just Microsoft, it's the major technology providers and the cloud providers that we all rely upon. And quite frankly, it's some of the smaller technology providers. We're doing a lot of work now with Avanti, mm -hmm. uh, for example, that's pre presented a very real threat. So th this is, this is years and years, as you know, this is decades, Margaret, when the dawn, when the internet came into being, security was never a priority. When software was developed, security was never a priority. It's why we've got an internet full of malware, software full of vulnerabilities, social media full of disinformation, and frankly, why I'm so concerned about artificial intelligence. All that said, there are things that technology manufacturers can do to help us fix it, and that's the most important thing we can do to catalyze a sustainable approach to cybersecurity. Um, I know we're getting close to questions from all of you. Um, but Ambassador, I want to follow up on something right at the introduction. I think artificial intelligence was referred to as the most significant technological development in the history of the world. Yeah. Is that how you see it, or is it just you, you view everything as a th through the threat lens at the moment. I don't actually, yeah. Margaret. And I'm, I'm 18 months in this role, but closer to 15 years before that as, a, as an investor and a software executive and entrepreneur, I, I view things through the lens of opportunity. Uh, and I actually think that in the AI governance uh, conversation, we need to keep innovation as our North Star. Uh, that ought to be the orienting principle for the United States because ultimately it is the wellspring of our strength. And our adversaries and competitors are, are working to out-innovate us. And if they do, then see my previous comment about everything else being downstream of that innovation. So we've worked really hard uh, around the world in the last year plus to make sure uh, that we maintain innovation as a North Star, of course, with guardrails. But uh, the White House started with voluntary commitments from the leading AI developers. Commitments around the safety of the models, the security of the models, the trust of their output. Uh, and then we worked multilaterally in the G7 uh, to develop the International Code of Conduct for AI developers built on the voluntary commitments under the Japanese presidency, and that will continue this year under the Italian presidency. Uh, and we worked at the UN and will continue to work at the UN on AI for good, bringing AI to bear on sustainable development goals and other challenges that affect us all, from weather forecasting to medical diagnostics. So uh, I, think, I think, of course, we have to acknowledge the risks, um, but we can't mitigate our way uh, out of innovating, first and foremost, which is ultimately the, the source of strength of the United States as a society and as an economy. Um, I think we are ready to move. Um, to all of you, if you want to raise your hand, and we'll get you a microphone, if you can say who you are and the organization you're from. Gavin Wild from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I have a question for Ambassador Fick. Much of what uh, the Pall Mall Declaration over the past couple of weeks, much of your work revolves around helping a coalition of states define what responsible behavior is in cyberspace. Much of that uh, it seems to revolve around defining the constraints that responsible states ought to put on themselves and in in, in how they use cyberspace. The recent NDAA kind of appears to put an, a more of an onus on, on the United States to use offensive cyber capabilities against some of our uh, non-state adversaries, particularly to the South and involved in the drug trade. How do you square 
kind of what seems to be the U.S. approach of responsibility is in being in the actions that you take and defining responsibility by acting. And the more international kind of coalition approach of defining how states ought to be more restrained in cyberspace. I'm curious for your thoughts there. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so the framework for responsible state behavior in, cyber, in cyberspace was, is the result of 20 years of ground game diplomacy, uh, like one yard, half a yard, and a cloud of dust uh, kind of diplomacy at the United Nations. Uh, it resulted in a pretty robust framework of uh, principles governing state behavior below the threshold of the use of force, uh, a set of confidence building measures to uh, lessen the chances of in inadvertent escalation, and general agreement that the body of human rights law and practice that developed offline extends naturally online. So we don't have to go back to ground zero as the Russians and the Chinese would like to and, and redefine those uh, those areas online. So that's what the framework does. Um, of course, our adversaries and competitors don't always abide by it. So there's a whole other set of questions around enforcement, deterrence, um, and, and we can put that aside for a moment. I, th I, think, the, I think the thrust of your question is, is, is really about, okay, then how does the U.S. operate offensively um, in the cyber domain in a world where we are signatories, adherence to this framework. Um, my answer, and this goes back to my private sector days too, is that we should think about offensive cyber capability as another tool in our national security toolkit. Um, we should never be conducting operations for operation's sake. It has to be in the service of some foreign policy objective. Uh, it needs to be done within the framework of appropriate oversight uh, in, in a democratic and accountable system. Um, but there's, there's been a little bit of a, of a veil um, around that world that is not necessarily helpful. Uh, I, I would argue for normalizing it, uh, talking about it, uh, and making clear when and how the use of those tools is appropriate and when they're not. And I'm kind of an a, a originalist in some way on these things. I would go back to Thomas Aquinas and just war theory and think about principles of proportionality and non-combatant immunity, and those are really hard to suss out sometimes in the cyber domain. But just because it, it's hard doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to do that work, and I think to be fairly open about uh, the, the, the trade-offs and the hard decisions that are inevitable in the course of coming up with policies in that area. Um, and on this side, uh, if we could run Sorry, go ahead, and then here at this uh, young lady. Take, yeah, taking advantage of already having the mic in my hand. Uh, <laughs> Rishi Iyengar from Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, Ambassador Fick, uh on the concept of digital solidarity that you, you spoke about, uh, I wanted to ask about your goal of putting a, a cyber diplomat in every embassy around the world. What is, what is the progress on that, and uh, how are countries uh, approaching it or how, what are countries expecting from that plan from the U.S.? So um, uh, for, first on digital solidarity, uh, we, we will be releasing the international cyber and digital strategy for the United States later this spring. Uh, the concept of digital solidarity will be one of the main through lines in that strategy. Uh, Director Easterly identified some of the key big moves in the national strategy and that are undergirding a lot of her work at CISA, I think this concept of digital solidarity should be seen as one of the big key moves undergirding um, our diplomacy. Part of operationalizing that, because the work of the State Department uh, doesn't really happen in Foggy Bottom, let's be honest. Uh, the real work of the State Department happens at the 200 missions around the world that are out on the ground. And so, uh, in standing up a new organization at state, a new function related to technology diplomacy, we have to push the expertise down and out, down to the edge where the decisions get made every day. And uh, a good way to do that, we thought, was to put a basically trained cyber and digital officer in every post around the world by the end of this year. Uh, I set that goal about a year ago. We have about a year to go. Uh, and we are about halfway in the training of those people. So uh, we're on track. By the end of calendar 2024, we should be there. And that will give us 
on a run rate basis because people move on, people retire, uh, but a run rate basis, as long as we continue training them at the front end, we will have a pool of diplomats um, that will grow over time that has the basic fluency in these issues that's necessary in a world where, you know, just like software is eating the world, tech is eating our foreign policy. Okay. Um, here, on the right. Hi, Ambassador Fick, Director Easterly, Maggie Miller with Politico. Hope you guys are both doing well. Um, I know, uh, Director Easterly, you mentioned that the train was held up due to bombing when you were um, heading into Kyiv. Can you talk a little bit about the physical threats you may have faced while you were on the ground and what Ukrainians are still potentially subjected to? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, Nate and I have both served in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as we were preparing for the trip, we weren't, weren't really sure what to expect, uh, frankly. Uh, it's a very long train ride from the Polish border. Uh, we were told it was going to be freezing cold and very uncomfortable. It actually turned out to be not so cold. So uh, that was a pleasant surprise. But uh, the train was held, as I mentioned, in the Kiev suburbs. And we had a security person with us who was getting alerts from the regional security office um, who let us know that there was a surface-to-surface -surface missile uh, bombing inside Kiev, and we could actually see uh, some of the um, flashes from our, our window um, to include some interceptions and some not. And we later found out that uh, five people lost their lives, several more wounded, and of course infrastructure was damaged. Um, y you know, I think that the key thing that I took from that was we experienced this. Um, we had no other issues with our physical security uh, during the day and were you know, well protected by the embassy. But this is what the Ukrainians go through every single day. And even as we watched people, you know, while the bombs were dropping, people were out walking. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what they deal with every day. And they have incredible, as I said, I go back to this word, resilience. Incredible resilience to deal with this barbaric onslaught. And so it was a very humbling experience to see that. And it just made me even more um, stronger in my views how important it is for us to continue to support Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Yeah, two, two quick things, Maggie. First, we were never in any danger. I mean, Jen, Jen went to West Point, spent 20 years in the Army. I did a couple of combat tours in the Marines. Like, we've been in danger. We were not in any danger, just to be mm -hmm. totally clear. Um, and it, it, that doesn't uh, in any way lessen the barbarism of the attacks on Ukraine that morning. Uh, I mean, think about it. Uh, missile attacks into apartment buildings uh, during the morning rush hour. I mean, this is, this is horrific and, and not, you know, a accidental targeting, not, you know, mm -hmm. weapons malfunctions. These are intentional terror attacks on civilians. And it's horrific. And as, as Jen said, you know, people died and several dozen were wounded, uh, you know, as, as we're sitting there kind of helplessly watching. What I'm curious, what are, uh, to the degree you can talk about it, Ukraine's offensive cyber tools like? I think it's fair to say, you know, back to my earlier point, that uh, Ukraine views um, uh, cyber in all of its dimensions as a tool of its foreign and national security policy, and they're pretty good at using it. Uh, and uh, an interest of ours is, is really making sure that our partners um, everywhere are using capabilities in accordance with uh, the rule of law and, uh, and the law of armed conflict. Um, and you know, the Ukrainians have demonstrated themselves to be incredibly innovative on every front. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that was the other big takeaway for me was the spirit of innovation. Um, when you think about what they're doing with the army of drones, one that just recently took out a Russian warship, mm -hmm. um, really incredible entrepreneurialism you know, both with when what they don't really have a naval force to build their yes, right. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to build their capabilities. I thought that was fantastic, but also some of the other things they're doing with the Delta system, which essentially is an online platform for surveillance and integrating command and control and situational awareness. The DIA app that does digitalization of services. So incredible innovation and entrepreneurialism going on across the board. And I think what they're trying to do kinetically actually will have a much greater impact. Um, here in the front, this gentleman. 
Hi, uh, good to see both of you. Sean Lingus with CNN. Um, wanted to get your reaction to a thought exercise. Um, if, you know, yesterday, as you probably saw, um, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee made a cryptic statement about a you know, military, foreign military capability that's since been reported as Russia's. Uh, I, I, don't, I think it's not cyber related, but I wanted to see how you would react if it was cyber related, if it was a new Sandworm GRU tool. Um, walk us through how you would talk to the public about that without creating uh, hysteria or panic. And, um, you know, how, how, how far are we from, from disclosing something like that? I mean, we've seen the pipe dream stuff uh, a couple years back, some other capabilities that, you know, definitely are disruptive, uh, you know, OT focused. So what's the playbook for disclosing something like that and how do you prevent a lawmaker from leaking it inadvertently or not? I mean, I, I'm happy yeah, to. Please. I'm happy to start. Um, uh, so, as you know, around the invasion of Ukraine, the intelligence community actually did a fantastic job of declassifying a bunch of um, uh, sensitive intelligence, and that was tremendously helpful to us as America's cyber defense agency because we were able to take that and provide it to industry as well as to state and local as part of our Shields Up campaign. And one of the things that I said throughout is this is preparation, not panic. Because my experience in both the military and the private sector and in government is if you scare the hell out of people, uh, they will, their brain will shut down <laughs> and they won't listen to anything that you've said. And so I think what uh, Director Haynes has been doing to try and create greater transparency and to declassify more will allow us, in the event of something like that, to be able to get the right information out to our partners so that they can understand the threat and that they can take action to build uh, the security and resilience that they need to do. So I have confidence that if it was something that was an imminent threat, we would act on it. I think what we heard yesterday is that it's not an imminent threat. But certainly, we are already working together with our interagency partners to ensure that we understand uh, what the risk is to the American people and that if there's, you know, we're both cyber and critical infrastructure, but we will do everything we can as an interagency to keep America safe and secure. If I can just add to that and, and uh, maybe praise uh, Jen in a way that she would not do for herself, she gave us a good example of this a couple weeks ago on Capitol Hill in the context of uh, Chinese activity in, in, on U.S. critical infrastructure. Um, capabilities are ephemeral, uh, intentions are ephemeral, it can be ephemeral, but capabilities tend to be more enduring. So uh, I think what you did on Capitol Hill and, and, and the way that I would answer this question is, um, have a, have a reasoned, clear-minded, uh, calm public discussion about capabilities, uh, recognizing that they can be fairly enduring, uh, and when married up to uh, nefarious intention, they can cause us a lot of problems. But let's not necessarily get into parsing the intentions, um, but talk about the capabilities. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the capabilities are disturbing. Um. To follow up on that, uh, in your testimony, Director Easterly, you told the House Select Committee, uh, Americans should have confidence in the integrity of our election infrastructure because of the enormous amount of work that's been done by state and local election officials, by the federal government, by vendors, and by the private sector since 2016. You were talking about the security of U.S. elections before this committee that was focused on China. Um, I know General Nakasone, who recently left uh, office, said these are going to be the most secure elections. I think we heard that last time, too. Um, how do you think of the upcoming election cycle, the threats, and what people at home need to know about it? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so we know that foreign adversaries have attempted to interfere and to influence our elections in 2016 and 2018 and 2020, 2022. The DNI just put out a declassified report that talked about the aggregate scope and scale of foreign activity affecting, mm -hmm. uh, looking to influence our elections. And we can expect to see that. 
this year. Now, all that said, I think what the American people need to understand is that election officials ran safe and secure elections in 2018, in 2020, in 2022. There is no evidence that malicious actors changed, altered, deleted votes, or had any uh, impact on the outcome of elections. And that has been validated time and again to include in multiple court challenges. And frankly, in 2020, where there was any margin uh, that was close, there were paper ballots mm -hmm. that could be counted and recounted and audited. Now, in this job, I've had the privilege to spend a lot of time with chief election officials, state election directors. They are some of the hardest working people doing sometimes a very thank thankless and difficult job. And I will say, if you spent time with them, and if you're skeptical of it, be an observer, be a poll worker, spend time talking to your election officials. If you spend time with them, you will have confidence in the security and integrity of our elections. I have confidence, and frankly, because of all the work that's been done by the election stakeholder community and the election officials themselves, the American people should have confidence in the security and the integrity of this year's election. Misinformation, however, how do you think of that as it surrounds yeah. the election? So full range of threats, right? The, the complex, the in, environment that election officials face this year is more complex than ever. It's not just cyber, uh, it's physical threats, unfortunately, insider threats, and yeah, foreign influence and misinformation. And so what we do is we work with election officials to ensure that they understand the tactics of foreign disinformation so they can recognize it uh, and be resilient to it. We do something called rumor control, which is really just election information, accurate information if people have a question. Actually, that has now been taken by state election officials so that they can use it to get that word out because frankly, they're the trusted people mm -hmm. on uh, accurate election information. And then we amplify their voices. And so the more that they can be that trusted voice, the more that they can get in front of the electorate and deal with you know, a flood of misinformation or disinformation and that people, citizens know who to look to for accurate information, that's the most important thing we can do. Um, do we have another question on this side? Here, this gentleman. Do you have a microphone? I'm coming. I'm coming. Okay. <laughs> Dustin Volz, Wall Street Journal. Uh, good to see you both back from Kiev. I'm glad you made it unharmed. Um, you as I, well. I, I did wake up to the uh, air raid and um, uh, slept through most of it, but I, I, I came back fine. Um, just uh, another question on uh, the Russia intelligence issue that's um, circulating. Um, Jen, a question for you. I know that talking about specifics is difficult, but um, my understanding is that satellites, threats to satellites of both physical and cyber dimensions are uh, highly concerning to officials and that satellites are seen for obvious reasons, being somewhat difficult to defend by the nature of them being in space and you can't sort of just go to them and do physical repairs and, and, um, and there's just lots of complications around that. So I was wondering if you could speak maybe um, specifically to how important satellites are to our resiliency uh, society-wide and in the event of some sort of calamity, um, some sort of physical or cyber or um, other form of attack, what would our capabilities be to sort of defend against that and, and recover and remain resilient against it? Yeah, I mean, I just speak broadly, as you know. You know, our role is to protect and defend the critical infrastructure that Americans rely on every hour of it every day. but the vast majority of that is owned and operated by the private sector. So we work very closely with them to ensure that they have capabilities, they have the intelligence and information, the resources to secure infrastructure across the board, but also to understand the need to build resilience into it. So Nate mentioned Viasat, a um, big attack that occurred after the invasion in February of 2022. Um, as we know, the Ukrainians then were able to shift over to Starlink, where they've been, uh, which they've been using, I think we used it when we were on the train, for communications. Um, and that has proven very resilient to date. So 
I think that's just a case in point that there needs to be other options. Um, and we need to ensure whether it's for military use and, or whether it's for civilian use that we are building resiliency into our critical infrastructure across the board. Does that answer your question? A little bit. I, I remember, <laughs> I on the sort of the trade formals that you and your testimony spoke about, uh, the law included water, uh, the infrastructure impact. Uh, I'm just trying to understand how concerned the panelists are, where those sort of links between that potential uh, threat to our They're up there. <laughs> They're up there, DV. If Russia could take out a satellite, just half <laughs> hypothetically speaking, yes, yes, <laughs> in a launch, recently disclosed, yes. Um, just to button that up, though, I do want to ask on Starlink. Um, now, reportedly, Russian forces are using Starlink. You said you just relied on it yourselves. How concerned are you about that vulnerability for the Ukrainians to have the Russians using it now? So the, the Ukrainian government uh, has said in the last several days that, uh, uh, that they believe the Russians are using Starlink for military purposes. I would have to refer questions on that to the Ukrainian government. Uh, I think a, a, a fair um, overarching statement, of course, is that uh, we do not support uh, the Russian military use of any American technology. American technology. Privately owned. Any American technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another conversation <laughs> for another day. Uh, but I know we're coming up on time. And I've been asked to close out for all of you. So I want to thank uh, everyone for attending on behalf of the German Marshall Fund today. Um, and thank you both for your time and your generosity. Thanks so thank much, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.